Hi everyone, my name is Katie McFarlane and I'm a current student at CBS graduating this May. I'm happy to introduce the next session, which is an alumni panel, and our panelists will discuss how every industry is utilizing and adapting to new technology. Our panelists are Alexandra Tibbetts, class of 99, who is the group product marketing manager at YouTube Learning, Dana Weeks, class of 2003, who is the co-founder and CEO of MedTrans Go, and Andrea Zaretsky, class of 2001, who is the chief marketing officer at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Allison Lindland, class of 2008 and the chief marketing officer at Movable Inc., will be moderating the conversation. Now I'll hand it over to Allison to begin. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here today on this kind of slushy day, but on this gorgeous campus to welcome our alumni panel. Uh, we are rounding out the program today with the really broad topic of how every industry is utilizing and adapting to new technologies. And I'm joined by a very esteemed group of panelists, and I'm actually gonna allow them to introduce themselves. And ladies, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves with the lens of throughout your career, how have you sort of focused on uh, sort of bringing in new technologies to your organizations? So Dana, you wanna start? Sure. So hello, everybody. I am uh, equally excited to be here uh, on campus in this new building. Uh, I live and work in Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, having a little bit of snow and a reminder of winter uh, is, is super fun and, and exciting. But um, uh, you know, just thinking back on the highlights of where kind of technology was a big part of what I've done, um, I'll start with what I'm currently doing. I co-founded and now am CEO of a health tech startup that um, focuses on providing healthcare providers the ability to increase efficiencies, uh, coordinate care, uh, and reduce cancellations by providing access to safe and reliable transportation and interpretation. Um, and I've been doing that since 2017, um, and it has been such an incredible journey because it really does the cross-section of a lot of things that I've done in terms of healthcare, um, but bridging that with utilizing technology in a way that not only benefits the customer, or it's just the healthcare provider, but also uh, patients uh, as well as uh, our team and, and otherwise. A couple other highlights I will say, uh, it's interesting, I think it, was, it made sense for me to be able to launch and build this company, but prior to business school, I actually worked um, launching a satellite radio company uh, in Africa and Europe. Um, and at that time, satellite radios were very new in the space, and so again, fast forward to now, it just seems that they're so commonplace um, that they were new. Um, and then when I first moved to Atlanta, I worked for initially for Singular, um, launching uh, social media as well as um, video apps. Um, and this was pre-iPhone, and this is pre-App Store. And um, at that time, really, it was a, a gamer's uh, community that utilized apps, and so now, of course, fast forward, it's so prolific and a part of everybody's, not only industry, but um, their day-to-day, -day. and so happy to talk about that. But those are just some highlights, but I, I, I think, you know, the topic, of course, is a kind of a no-brainer because, you know, just involved in lots of different boards and other activities where technology is, of course, a big part of everything we do. So. Awesome. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, hey, I'm Alex Tibbetts. Um, I'm class of 1999, and I never thought I would leave New York when I was here, um, but I got pushed out the door to go interview at Amazon, uh, even though I think I had the flu, and um, they interviewed me in my hotel room in order to save money. They, they wouldn't pay for um, buses to get us to the office or, um, <laughs> or conference rooms to interview us in. Um, but I fell in love with this idea of the, the physical and the digital and having to deal with both at the same time. And they fed us burritos in the warehouse while we packed books. And wow. um, so that's what got me out to the West Coast. And I spent about four years at Amazon and then nine years at Microsoft where I built Ad Center, which is a competitor to Google AdWords as Google was rising in its, its um, dominance. And then um, 
about nine years ago, I moved to YouTube, and it was about the size that Amazon was when I first went to Amazon and have seen uh, YouTube grow. Um, I'm working now on YouTube learning, like bringing YouTube, making it work better in schools, and also bringing more structured uh, experiences around learning to YouTube. That's what I'm doing today. But all, the red thread through all of it has been really launching firsts um, and, and uh, taking advantage of the new platform capabilities that have become available. Awesome. Thank you, and it's great to be here as well. This is really my backyard. I went to Columbia Business School and really never left the Upper West Side. Um, so it's really amazing to be back and see this incredible building and be here today. Um, so I graduated in 2001 and uh, started a career in marketing. And I've been in marketing at a number of companies over the last 20 plus years. We were just speaking before this and couldn't believe how fast time goes. Um, before business school, I was actually a journalist. I worked at the New York Times. And through my experience there, I decided to kind of trade my pen um, for a different way of, of influencing and, and sharing a story and, and other types of narratives. So I decided to pursue marketing. I joined American Express after graduation. I was there for 15 years. I had nine different roles. I covered every aspect of marketing. And through it all, technology has been a key enabler for everything we want to do whether it's you know, changing brand perceptions, that it's not your father's credit card, to um, coming up with capabilities to engage clients at different stages of life. After American Express, I did a couple of st uh, stops in retail. I had an infamous stop at Toys R Us in their final <laughs> days of Jeffrey, but it's back. Um, and then I spent some time at Sephora working on sort of their front to back marketing transformation, which technology was thematic in throughout. And uh, then I took a role to be the chief marketing officer of E-Trade. I had been a customer for many years, and it was really an aspiration of mine to lead brand and performance marketing. And uh, shortly after arriving, we were acquired by Morgan Stanley. So that is where I sit today. I have responsibility for both the E-Trade and the Morgan Stanley Wealth Management brands. And uh, you know, again, really working closely on a number of technology initiatives, data. The unlock of data is everything in terms of really differentiating how you can engage clients. So that's central to everything I've done and everything I'll do going forward. Awesome, thank you. Sure. And uh, just to give the audience some context on my own background, um, I actually graduated in 08 and then had the great pleasure of joining Amex as well, where I first got to know Andrea. Uh, I had some interesting forays in new technology. I launched the first iPhone app. It was funny to hear you talk about a world where there were no apps. There was one brief year when the app store was sort of locked down. Um, and then I also, during the uh, recession, was sort of furloughed and was on a task force to launch the first, uh, what came to be the first Twitter handle at Amex. So those were some really interesting kind of formative experiences for me for like uh, bringing in new technologies to large scale enterprises, which is like quite the art form. Um, I left and um, quickly joined a startup called Movable Inc. I was the 14th employee and fast forward now I'm in my 11th year um, and we achieved our unicorn status last year. We have 600 employees in uh, 10 countries and I have the pleasure of working with Andrea again uh, on the vendor side. So it's been an exciting decade. So. All right, uh, into some questions. So um, I think the panels earlier today kind of really hit on a lot of the tremendous technological changes that are going on, whether it's blockchain, metaverse. Um, we heard about TikTok and you know, the work that Agnes is doing um, with all the media transitions. For us, it's things like AI, ML, um, VR. Um, can we speak to some of the trends that we are really confronting in our daily jobs and you know what's really the tech that's actually driving these changes? What are we bringing into our organizations to help? Dana, you want to start? Uh, sure. Uh, well, of course, uh, at the heart of, of everything we do, um, is a lot of these terms are important. Um, we are integrating and growing, uh, utilizing AI um, and just data analytics and, and analysis in a in, in new in new ways, um, but we're we're seeing in healthcare, especially, um, 
rapid, rapid change. And I think of all the industries, um, technology uh, is the slowest to move within healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just in the 80s was the first time we saw, um, you know, moving to electronic records. Mm -hmm. um, in the 2000s, you're seeing electronic health records utilized. But the infrastructure and the system and the people who are within healthcare are not necessarily matched to the, the uses and the need. And so a lot of what is done is just done because it's always been done that way. And so um, being able to see and be a part of this real stage of innovation because it's necessary and because what we saw, especially with the pandemic um, and what it's revealed is that not only do we need technology to help us uh, survive as, as patients, but we need our healthcare providers to be able to have these types of, of, of options um, because there's just so much burnout. There's so much mm -hmm. um, uh, cost waste mm -hmm. um, that is causing challenges that if we don't solve it with technology, um, we will see real impacts to um, our, you know, our, our overall community and our, our lives and our health, which is, of course, high stakes. High stakes. Yeah. Yeah. My, um, my daughter's pediatrician asked us to fax them something, and my au pair <laughs> asked me legitimately, what is a fax? You know? so, right? That's exactly just, right. Yeah. You, you, um, it, is, it is wild uh, to think we just signed a deal with a huge health system uh, last September, and prior to us um, working with them, they, they were completely analog. They said we would call in to order rides, we would be able to uh, wait on the phone, and then there's a shift change, and just them going through it, and they, they, they gave an example, uh, the head of the rehab department said, you know, I don't understand if I can order a pizza <laughs> and watch my driver, yeah and pay and get it all there. Why I can't do the same thing for patience and efficiency. So not a lot of PII on your pizza. No. <laughs> well, we <it> might be, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, we there's, but they're interesting. In, and I'm sure that um, you will be able to speak a little more to this, but there's just interesting um, ability to understand the marketplace with the right type of analytics and numbers to be able to predict outcomes, to be able to really uh, perfect and understand who we are as patients, how we are health. And in some senses, it makes it more equitable because the numbers reveal what's really there versus a hunch Absolutely. or a thought. Yeah. So speaking of dealing in a sort of more regulated world, uh, Andrea, tell sure. us what's going on in financial services. Yeah, I think um, you know, with, with each of, particularly in financial services and in each of the companies I've been on, even beauty, uh, personalization, I think, is the name of the game in terms of deepening the relationship with the clients you have. And so to do that, you really need the data. Mm -hmm. So whether it's first party or third party, machine learning, algorithms, anything you can do to unlock the power of that data to better serve the client is what we're all striving to do. Um, so within financial services, I think you know we're working hard to make sure that we are leveraging all of those capabilities, um, you know, through modeling. We have an initiative called Project Genome, where we're really trying to build a brain to better understand our clients. We want to pick up all of the signals when they interact with us, uh, so that we can make sure that I think it's because of my neighbor here and the time at Amazon, there's an expectation by consumers that you know them and that you're going to put something really value added in front of them. Mm -hmm. And I think stakes have never been higher. So I think we're really trying to harness the power of that data to do that job really well. Um, it's a lot of test and learn. We're working with companies, even Allison's, for my third or fourth company. Yes. I think we're partnering together. It shows the power of that Columbia Business School network. Um, but you know, any type of capability that can help with dynamic testing, doing a lot of experimentation, figuring out what works for different cohorts of c consumers and clients um, is incredibly powerful and important. I think you also hit the nail on the head by saying that uh, consumer expectations are so elevated and there's this sort of widespread um, myth that, oh, you know, customers don't like to be um, like tracked online and they're sort of dubious about all this. And we yeah. did some original research last year, which is the second year we did it in a row. And actually that doesn't hold true at all, that they are very smart, they're astute, and you know, even people in their 60s understand that there's this quid pro quo and what they what they don't like is when they give you that data and you don't use it, right? So that's so what's interesting. And just to build on that, we did a study as well that showed you know, consumers believe you have permission to reach out to them if it's value added. Mm. So you have to use the data well. It's yeah. one thing to have the data, but then how are you gonna present something really compelling? Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. 
So what's going on at YouTube? Yeah, um, well, when we looked at the opportunity to, to do more learning, more structured learning on YouTube, we found that a lot of the other sites and apps out there have been really successful reaching people that have already been successful in an academic environment. So the opportunity for YouTube was to grow the business um, and enable people to learn from people that are already a fan of on YouTube in a fun and entertaining way and really try to break through to people who haven't already been successful in, in academics. Um, I think uh, AI and generative AI holds a lot of promise and we're um, partnering across Google to try to bring some of those technologies uh, to YouTube over time. What I think is so interesting right now about the sort of fervent run towards AI and ML is that unlike sort of trends in the past where it was like, sure, like wearables, okay, why not? Um, people, the CMOs that I'm talking to are saying, we want to invest in you know, AI and ML, but it needs to contribute to the bottom line like in the next two quarters. People are not interested in funding this out of their innovation budgets. They want to see a tangible result very, very quickly. So that's a real mindset shift to three or four years ago when you know, there were new technologies popping up and people were you know, kind of willing to, to flirt with them and then just say, it's a fun experiment. You know? But I yeah. think that obviously the tides come out on the economy and no one has time for that, so yeah. Um, so obviously these technologies don't provision themselves. They don't just show up at an organization and like walk into the server room and <laughs> make the results like drive themselves. So they need um, agents of change and champions to really bring them into the organization, set the expectations and shepherd them through to success and then create you know, sort of hero stories that everyone can believe in. So what does it mean to be a change agent and a champion within these modern enterprises? And how have you in your careers created a culture of innovation and evangelism? And Andrea, I've worked with you on this several times. This has really been your playbook. So can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, and I've worked at a lot of very established traditional companies where it may be a little bit Mm -hmm. different um, than a, more of a startup to have that culture. But I think most important is that you have to show employees that it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to fail fast, but that's part of innovation and that's part of driving change and transformation. So you have to celebrate not only the wins, and you should celebrate a lot of small wins along the way given the impatience yeah. um, by leadership at, at all of the companies, but I think it's okay to also say what you learned from when things didn't go well. Yeah and showcase those and um, you know, show that that's just part of the process. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been really uh, helpful in terms yeah. of driving a change agenda. And I think what you've done so well too is create this culture of like bringing people together to sort of share those learnings quickly. So it's not like, oh, we'll wait like four months for a readout. Like, no, let's meet bi-weekly for a readout. I remember um, rolling out Agile for the first time, which is just a way of working more quickly with lots of cross-functional teams organized as pods, you know, a completely different way of working at one of my companies. And I think one thing that we did that was very successful is you know, every day we had a stand-up, which is just part of Agile, but when we had a win in those very early weeks, we banged a gong. Yeah. And I think we got everybody to celebrate <laughs> yeah. and we brought everyone in and it, it could be the most minute yeah. thing, but I think just, you know, we see making people feel good, driving inspiration, building morale, really important. Because these change uh, projects are very tough. Mm -hmm. No, it is, it is change in general. No. Yeah. That's the hardest part. We always say it's not the technology, it's the humans. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, Alex, what about you? Yeah, and I would say it, it, it varies a lot depending on whether you're in a challenger position or in a more dominant position in your market. And sometimes, like at Microsoft, they were used to winning at things. Mm. And then when we launched Bing, we were a challenger brand and had to come up with new and different strategies. So we looked for things where it would be expensive for a competitor to match what we were doing. And we had a couple of fail fast experiments there that I personally owned and dra drove. Uh, one was called Bing Cash Back, where we would give rebates or try to pay people to come use Bing. Um, it didn't work, um, but it was, it was um, we, we integrated PayPal and Amazon yeah. payments, and it did give us a chance yeah. to see how other companies were working. Mm -hmm. um, we also licensed social feeds from both Twitter and Facebook to see if we could use the social signal to improve mm -hmm. our search results. And again, it didn't work, it didn't, it didn't succeed, but it did give us um, insight into how Facebook was working differently. And um, I hosted the first hackathon where we had engineers mm. from Facebook and Microsoft sitting yeah. side by side. Wow. 
Um, How was that? Diplomacy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, was very, it was very cool. And uh, we had, um, Chi Lu was our senior vice president at Microsoft at the time, and um, Mark Zuckerberg came and mm. hosted, like co-hosted this hackathon together. And it just, it, it was really powerful in terms of um, inspiring the Microsoft teams to feel like they were current and innovative um, and, um, and, and were, had the permission to fail and experiment. Andre, can you talk a little bit about um, the experiences you had in DPD and working with these sure. innovative uh, companies? Yeah, it's, it's an, another one for a very established company, American Express. Um, this is going back some time, but you know, to capture interest from a younger consumer, they really had to change their perception as your father's credit card to something much more new and modern. So uh, we created a startup within the company called Digital Partnerships, which you know, really operated separately from the rest of the company. And you know, our goal was to look in our data and see where were, where were younger consumers spending. And what we saw, this is pre-unicorn, Uber, and Airbnb. Companies like those are where our younger consumers were spending time. So we reached out to those companies um, in Silicon Valley. We sp spent a lot of time doing trips. And then we brought our engineers together, similar to your example. Um, you know, not necessarily the business people coming up with the strategy, but engineer to engineer, what could we craft that might be really unique and differentiating? What did those companies need that American Express could provide? At the time, it was loyalty programs. Mm. They, want, they were in competitive positions mm -hmm. themselves, and they wanted to differentiate in terms of driving share in their markets. So we crafted, uh, we let them ride on the rails of the American Express Membership Awards program. And I think that type of work gave us credibility in that space, appealed to younger consumers, and helped change sort of the, the demographic mix of who we were attracting. So that was highly experimental, not easy, um, no. many failures along the way, uh, but some, qu some quick wins that we were able to celebrate to get us to where we needed to go. And just such a great example, again, of like, you know, bringing two cultures together, mm -hmm. which again, is like all about the people. Um, I had a funny story as we were prepping for this um, that I was reminded when I was doing the, um, the mobile app, which actually involves you, Andrea, um, which was um, when I was doing the um, iPhone app development, it was in the throes of the recession and at Amex, and you know, the students here are too young to remember this, but you know, this was a real, um, similar to now, you know, there were a lot of uh, restructures going on. Amex had let go a fair amount of people, and um, we just did not have a lot of people. So I was doing product marketing for the iPhone app and product development as sort of my, my side gig. And what I would promise people was I used my network through Columbia and also through the internship program. And everyone had like, I don't know, it was like 5% of your job was around innovation. And so I would say to my friends, um, hey, for your 5% for innovation, bring me in as a guest speaker to your team meeting, VP meeting, town hall, whatever. And I sort of couched myself as this like mobile evangelist. And my credentials were basically that I just read a lot of stuff on the internet. <laughs> you know, like that was it. And then it also turns out that um, Columbia has something called, I don't know if they still have it, this location-based services um, conference. And they also have a telco think tank. So when I had returned to Columbia from my internship, um, I sought them out and I did a like sort of internship with them and worked on this location-based services uh, conference. So I had some sort of skin in the game and some vague credentials, but mostly I was just reading a lot of TechCrunch, you know? Anyway, I would customize my presentations for these VP teams, so it was like, if it's the Starwood group, I would, you know, be it about like how mobile is going to transform hospitality. And like nowadays, you check into a hotel, you don't have to talk to anybody. Like it's amazing how much mobile has transformed it, right? Uh, and if it was like the Delta team, again, I would do the same for aviation. But um, I would start out the meeting with a little bit of provocation, and I would go to their page on the Amex uh, home site, and I would show what it looked like on a mobile device, and I would take a screenshot, and then I would show what the traffic was to that page on mobile browsers and that always really got everyone's attention and then I would also ask for um, space in their newsletter and I just remember doing that for um, for one of your town halls which Good. is create a burning platform I think yeah. it's a great mm. strategy to so, drive evangelism for yeah. sure it was uh, it was a lot of fun, fun. so <laughs> uh, what's great about the new technologies as they come up that yeah. you can just make yourself the expert just that's takes right. the will totally. and, that's right. and that's what I would I say I mean obviously being a uh, from in a startup, you know, innovation and change is at the heart of everything we do every day, uh, every minute, and, and finding ways to get that from each of the team members is, is huge. But if I look back on my career, I was able to sort of enter into new spaces because um, it was a new technology. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think back, you know, talk about the uh, iPhone app, 
you know, when we first started launching uh, social media apps on AT&T, um, we had already launched MySpace on mobile phone. And I remember sitting with the Facebook executives and they're saying, Facebook is a desktop app. Like, we will never be able to do that on mobile. And of course, fast forward and you're thinking, this yeah. is so crazy. But I, I, th I think it's one of those things where it's very exciting to be in a place that's going to change so rapidly. And so where you can kind of look back and see mm -hmm. that these are entry points that you can go in because you can fail, because they don't have a history of uh, success. And so you're reinventing it and having that innovation and change in that way. Oh, it makes it so exciting. Yeah, yeah. and very exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome. Um, so when you have these new technologies, obviously something that's as kind of old as the concept of technology itself is the decision to buy versus build, right? And you're kind of always weighing that tension within organizations. Um, so I'm just curious when you're you know, championing that and you're trying to drive change management, how do you think about those frameworks, uh, especially in, in larger organizations, Andrea? Sure. Um, and definitely I'm, all of us have had to do this so many times, but the framework that I've developed, that I've been using lately is time to mark, if, when you're evaluating, can you do this, can, you, can your team build this, or should you use an outside vendor or partner? Mm -hmm. And you know, some of the criteria are time to market, which would be faster, mm -hmm. what would it cost, and then do you have the internal skills and proprietary knowledge to even do it well? So I think those three are really helpful in evaluating different options. And what I found uh, you know, in terms of a couple of recent projects is a hybrid has worked best. Mm -hmm. you know, as much as we can build ourselves and keep proprietary, particularly with data being yep. so uh, important today, um, I think we've been embarking on that. And then bring in some, some technological capabilities we don't have in-house that would be very tough to try to build um, has been sort of our, our go-to-market. And it's been working. Yeah. I think you know, it, it is important, though, in addition, you know, when you're choosing that partner, as you're develop, you know, going into a deal, I think shared goals are critical. Mm -hmm. And then do as much team building as possible and treat, treat your joint team as one team mm -hmm. um, from a cultural standpoint uh, so that you can really, uh, I think, gel and, and make sure that you operate really well together. Awesome, yeah. Mm -hmm. Alex, what about you? Yeah, my observation has been that there's often a big bias to build. Mm -hmm. And so these moments when you get to step back and look at partner or can we partner, can we acquire, or should we build? Mm -hmm. It's such a precious moment to get really clear on the strategy and what, are you, what do you need to believe to choose the option is like the framework we, oh, sure. that I find often is the most helpful. Um, but there's still just sort of built-in biases that, um, that are difficult often to overcome. Um, when Microsoft was looking at um, uh, Overture was a search engine marketing company that Yahoo ended up buying. Well, we brought that to Bill Gates, and he just turned bright red because he couldn't believe the number of people they had in operations. Mm -hmm. And who would ever need all those people in operations? Wow. <laughs> but he'd never run an advertising business yeah. before. Um, so we passed on that, and we went and built Ad Center. Uh -huh. um, but only a few years later, Google bought DoubleClick, mm -hmm. and that was a totally yeah. different context and environment. And so Microsoft aggressively went, over, went after a quantum immediately thereafter. And so these sort of competitive and environmental factors really outweigh, in some cases, yeah. um, much of the, the analytics. Because it's not just about the building, it's also about the maintaining, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, um, and also then the cultural piece too, you know, do you want to have X number of data scientists or engineers or operations people on staff and then constantly be sort of recruiting and supporting and developing those careers. I mean, it's just a very different ball of wax. So it's uh, something that we deal with all the time. And I think just coming on the sort of partner perspective is, you know, it's it, we are, um, totally upfront about the fact that we know that our clients are having these conversations. Like that's not a secret, you know. And we just want to know what are the sort of laws of gravity within that organization because you know we want to meet them at the table um, in their sort of language and um, sort of answer those questions, you know, in the light of day. Um, and and we'll help them. And like you said, we'll have a partner solution if that's what they want. Um, but it's not a secret that you know people have the will to try and build this stuff themselves, um, it just often isn't the right path forward. Um, 
Awesome. So once you do get the uh, buy-in on that new technology and that budget, um, how do you then set yourself up for success? I mean, obviously, there's always going to be bumps in the road, um, you know, and there's always going to be failures. So how do you set expectations with leadership, um, you know, with your own team so that you can stay motivated? Because any tech process is going to be a bit of a marathon, and we don't want to lose steam along the way. So you have credibility to ever do this again. Andrew, you want to start? Sure, sure. And I think you know, just learning over time, <laughs> some best practices. I think you know, with with whoever you're bringing on, if you're in a case where you're not going to build, but you're going to buy, um, establishing upfront what are the metrics of success, what's the cadence by which you're going to check in, what are you going to report out, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that you really stick to that. Implementations are so tough, and you don't know what you don't know when you're going in, particularly with a brand new technology. The ones I'm thinking of are consumer data platforms mm. have been really all the rage mm -hmm. in terms of MarTech, um, and in a number of the categories I've worked in, I have deployed two, and it's really tricky. Um, you know, you have to hook that up to all of the pipes to get your, you know, oh, use yeah. your intelligence to put the right message through whether you want it on social media or an internal channel. Um, so very tricky implementations. So I think just getting to that regular cadence of reporting and shared goals. Um, and then I think escalating early when, when there's something unsolvable mm -hmm. um, and, and showing that it's OK and it's expected to have some issues um, is important, too, to manage expectations. We've had clients um, share stories where they have partners where the contract is coming up for renewal and they still haven't seen implementations. Yeah, you know, and, long and road. Yeah, that that yeah. can you know I'm not gonna say that's the norm, but it's sort of acceptable in enterprise software when you're working with large scale companies, you know, and um, big complex integrations. And as you know, a leader, <coughs> it's just very threatening to your credibility, you know. So you really have had to set a lot of expectations uh, to survive that. I think one other thing I'd say is we, we learned to do is just start with a small pilot. Yeah. It's just impossible to do the large scale integration. Okay. And the small pilot gets to market faster, satiates you know, stakeholders internally, and you learn a lot about how to do the full scale integration awesome. in an even stronger way. So definitely small pilot. Alex, what about you? Um, oh, setting expectations with leaders when you do. Oh, right. Um, I, my observation has been that the cross functional teams. Um, need active management. And it's this program manager role is often underfunded. Yeah. But essentially, if you, if you want something to be successful, you have to staff it and make it someone's job to make this successful mm -hmm. at the end of the day. They have to be it like might a, be different in a, a, a whip. You know, outside a big company. Well, I mean, I think the question is designed around uh, a big company, um, which, which we're not. So we have some ability to be nimble. Um, um, but we, we, we deal with some of the same buy versus build questions, oh, yeah. um, even within. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, the instinct um, is that we build it because that's what our vision is, and we're creating a problem or we're solving a problem that, <clears throat> that needs to be solved. Um, but, you know, I mean, we're, we're just, it's usually about cost, um, and is it something that we can do ourselves? Um, but we're also kind of positioning ourselves to be that potential um, acquired company that um, is is providing that solution. So I don't know that I have very much to add, given the yeah. context of this question. I think the the bias, yeah, at a startup is like, of course we're going to build it. <laughs> That's what we do. All we do is build things. So, um, but you can you can get caught and lost in trying to get and build something that's already been built mm -hmm. that you could probably more effectively just buy something, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. <clears throat> at a smaller scale. And it will save you much more time and money Absolutely. if your end goal is something um, bigger. For sure. Yeah. Um, so thinking about um, you know, our audience, um, you know, many of our careers, and, and especially the people who are uh, students currently, uh, are really going to be determined by technologies that haven't been invented yet, uh, which is kind of terrifying to think about, um, but uh, if you were an MBA student today, what types of skills would you be investing in and thinking about right now to you know, work with this framework? Dana, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think the fundamental um, need is continues to be that human connection. Um, being persistent, being resilient, um, and being curious. Um, I, I remember, actually, I'm going to having more references to AT&T than I have in a long time. But um, 
I remember there was a, a gentleman who was, he sat in an office and it was sort of random and everyone would pass by and who is this guy, who is this guy? Um, and I happened to run into him in the parking lot um, and befriended him because he ended up having the same name, Dana. Uh -huh. And so we just started chatting and so we sort of chatted a little bit more and I sort of learned under full um, privacy and not to, uh, not to say anything, uh, that he was part of the team to bring the iPhone to AT&T. Oh, wow. And so I early on got to see the actual iPhone prototype and learn about that. But just, it was, it was based out of a conversation and curiosity. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I think, you know, as we're thinking about, you know, it, technologies that are yet to be done, that if you continue to stay engaged, whether it's, um, you know, researching, uh, being out there, showing up, finding out things that you, you actually do end up running into either the early stages of or um, deep into something that ultimately could be the next new thing. Totally, I love that. Kismet, amazing. Yeah. Alex, yeah. how about you? Yeah, I'd say something really similar, which is just about building your network and really investing in it and spending the time on it. And I think the person who drove this home for me the most was Sheryl Sandberg. She used to do uh, monthly salons in her house. And I was on one occasion invited, and she interviewed George Lucas and Melody Hobson. And it was fascinating, but also like just as much, fa just as fascinating to talk to the other people who were there. So I was like fearful I would never be invited again. So I went back to Seattle and it took me about a year and a half, but I figured out how to replicate, like pretend I was Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg. And I, I recruited um, Maria Clave, is the, was the president of Harvey Mudd College, an engineering college in Southern California. And she was on the board of Microsoft at the time. So she would come to Seattle once a quarter. And I just, I'd met her at a conference and I discovered like, you know, she had a, a night alone in a hotel every time she came up to Seattle. So I said, well, let me program this night for you and I'll find someone for you to interview. And we kicked off with Melinda Gates and we later had Kara Swisher. But still, these were just excuses to get everybody together because it was really like the, the lasting, those are just like one-off moments, but it's the, the friendships that form and the mutual support. And I swear every time I you know, impress anyone at work, it's I'm channeling a friend, like something a friend told me. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Amazing. Andrea, yes. what about you? That's hard to follow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Tell us your Melinda Gates story. Yeah. yeah. Well, why not? <laughs> no, I can't. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think a couple of things. One, I think some of the skills you learn at Columbia are the top skills for today. Collaboration. You're in clusters. You're learning to work as a team. You are figure out your roles within that team. And that is, I think, the number one skill, uh, number one soft skill in any job that you pursue. And then the other thing I'd say is just, you know, be true to yourself and be a lifelong learner. Get involved with what you're passionate about. Show your passion wherever you are, you know, whether it's through networking, through reading all the incredible endless thought leadership that's out there on every topic. Um, I think, you know, showcase your value, keep learning, become the expert. I think you had a really good example earlier, Allison, about like you just, you know, anointed yourself the evangelist and became the expert of mobile. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are really effective strategies. I'm still going Have a growth mindset. on Twitter. Yeah. You, know, you can't, yeah. can't miss me. Um, <laughs> so our last question is about, you know, that after graduation moment, you arrive at an organization and, you know, it was so classic. I show up at Amex and I've got my MBA and then everyone has an MBA, you know, and uh, you might not immediately have the opportunity to influence like broad scale tech decision making on an enterprise level, um, but you can still lay a foundation or maybe influence in other ways. Um, like for example, one of my bosses sort of familiarized me with the term of like reverse mentorship pretty early on, oh, yeah. which was something I sort of came to use um, pretty avidly. Like there are a lot of senior leaders who are afraid to ask in public like what is TikTok, you know? <laughs> so like be the person who will go to their office like after hours or really early and show them what TikTok is, you know? <laughs> and um, so that's, you know, one hot take, but I'm just curious, like, if you have some tactical advice or um, thoughts from your own experience to share about those early years in your career when you're maybe not championing and buying technology yourself. Danny, you wanna start? Um, I, I will just say, so out of business school, I went and worked for Pfizer, and so it was a big um, healthcare company where you know you you definitely felt like a, a bit of a cog um, yeah. in the in the in the wheel. 
Um, but I think, you know, I kind of would jump outside of my professional situation and think about, um, you know, almost a resume that you can get involved in, um, in community, either uh, not for profits, your, your schools, um, and, you know, now, of course, being on boards, both public and private, um, it is the real opportunity to, um, to show your passion to be around people um, like the Sheryl Sandbergs when they, because they have limited time. And so if they're also um, volunteering for um, a, a school board, uh, for example, you know, I, I, since we're saying names, it, you know, I, for, for being a working mother uh, of three children and to be able to be involved in an organization, I was at my, my school, uh, school uh, with Roz Brewer, who um, oh. is now yes. CEO of uh, Walgreens, yeah. and to be able to work on projects with her, mm -hmm. um, it it allows for those opportunities. Amazing outside, and and even if it's you're doing you know some menial task, I think straight out there are just real opportunities even outside of the professional role that you can then do that. And then if I fast forward, a lot of that work that I did actually landed me seats. Um, you know, now I'm on a, a, an alternative asset management company board that manages over 132 billion in uh, assets. And you're think, and I'm thinking, what am I, what am I doing on that? I'm, I was a marketing person. How am I in this role? But I think a lot of that is those connections mm -hmm. outside of your exact role. And those experiences are real. Those mm -hmm. are real, like, mm -hmm. cut your teeth experiences. I, yeah. I remember bringing um, the concept of the cloud to a nonprofit that I was on. Like, we could put all of our documents on the cloud, and they might be a little more secure than on these hard drives of these old computers. And they treated me like I was Bill Gates. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Aww, I love that. You, Alex? Yeah, I think that those early jobs is all about problem solving. Just mm -hmm. And you can do that in any job. Like, you could practically roll the dice and just take a job, mm -hmm. and there'll be an interesting problem to solve. As long as you know, keep in mind, like, why does this problem matter? Why is it worth solving? And you're collecting those stories for yourself. Um, my first role at Amazon was in finance, and um, that, that first season was the first season we sold electronics instead of just books, music, and video. And so we'd never had an obsolete inventory problem before. So that, like, that first uh, holiday season, most of the corporate staff went off to the warehouse to help pack the, pack the boxes. And I stayed behind with the auditors and developed the inventory write-off uh, algorithms. So how would we know how much you know, this TV was worth um, or that um, you know, kid's electronic toy was worth given, um, given we didn't think we could sell it next year, it was for this holiday. Yeah. Um, so it was just an example of collecting experiences, um, even when you find yourself in situations where you don't have a background or even maybe even an interest, but you can still um, you can still learn so much from it. Amazing, Andrea brings. I think up. just a, a little bit of a build on, on both of your ideas. Um, you know, first when I was new, newly minted MBA, I think you get your kind of cog job. <laughs> I think that was actually <laughs> absolutely correct. And so, but sometimes there's interesting cross-functional projects that you can raise your hand mm -hmm. for. And I think I always tried to do that because it helped me meet people outside of my day to day mm -hmm. and build like a network with uh, leaders that I wouldn't necessarily come across in my in my certain, you know, placement at the company. So that was really effective for me. And then the other um, thing, similar to what you said, is industry associations. You know, from the beginning I was involved in many marketing associations over the years. That helped me develop, you know, in addition to my Columbia network, a great network of other marketing leaders at a variety of categories and verticals. I've kept in touch with those folks over the years. They have been extremely helpful to have as, you know, an advisory board and panel. Um, so I think, you know, once you figure out your industry, I think leaning in there is, is a really great way to continue to build a network and grow. Awesome, these are all great tips. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have. So thank you so much for joining us.